Salary caps exist in many commercially successful sports around the world. The most obvious examples are the NFL and most recently in Formula One. A salary cap is an agreement or rule that places a limit on the amount of money that a team can spend on players' salaries. In rugby, it's generally a total squad spend and not a restriction upon individual salaries. In this video, we will look at the impact salary caps has had on different leagues globally and attempt to understand what positive and negative effects they contribute to. Well, Premiership Rugby first led the way when they introduced a salary cap in 99. They wanted all clubs to be on a level playing field in order to create an entertaining product and also to ensure that clubs didn't spend more than they could afford. Another reason for the salary cap in the Prem was to make sure that the teams develop youth and local talent rather than just purely high value imports. Last season, the salary cap in the Prem was reduced by 1.4 million pounds to 5 million with an allowance for only one marquee player who can be paid independently of the cap. This decision was made due to the catastrophic financial effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. This video is brought to you by Manscaped, the very best in men's below the belt grooming. They're offering all viewers of this video 20% off their entire product range and free worldwide shipping. All you have to do is use the code RUGBYPOD. That includes the incredible Lawnmower 4.0 package. So go and use the code RUGBYPOD at checkout at manscaped.com. Trust us, your balls will thank you and we can make more videos like this. Across the channel in France, the top 14 league also adheres to a salary cap. However, with French rugby being a lot more commercially successful, boasting the most lucrative television deal in world rugby, the salary cap is hardly restrictive at £8.5 million per season. This vast salary cap allows the top 14 to continually bring over the best players in the world and has given them back-to-back -back European champions and a finalist in six out of the last seven finals. Last year's top 14 champions, Montpellier, owned by Syrian billionaire Mohed Altrad, were suspected of breaking the salary cap rules, but had their fine of €400,000 revoked. According to ex Toulon chairman Mourad Boudjilal, the salary cap is a massive farce where the most virtuous cheat and get away with murder. So it's safe to say in France, the salary cap doesn't seem to be being enforced. Sales Sharks director rugby Alex Anderson, after a defeat to Montpellier last year, suggested that the Premiership salary cap is a major handicap for English clubs in Europe, as they can't attract the same quality of players and so are always going to be at a disadvantage. However, there was one English club who did manage to thrive in Europe recently. In late 2019, Saracens were found to have breached the Premiership salary cap in three previous seasons and were fined £5.3 million and relegated to the Championship. Saracen's owner Nigel Ray was found to have made payments totaling 1.3 million by entering into joint property ventures with players, and his daughter's hospitality company was also found to make lump payments of nearly 100 grand to Mario Toje, alongside some other speculative dealings. Leicester Tigers, who became Prem champions by defeating Saracens in June, were also recently punished for breaching the salary cap. Finishing on the topic of European success, Leinster have won the European Cup four times in the last 12 years, and unlike the English or French teams, they're not restricted by a salary cap. The URC teams are not confined with expenditure, in part because of the international nature of the tournament and the varying economic conditions in the respective countries, as well as their unions. All four Irish teams are operated and funded by the IRFU and supposedly have equal funding, but it's no secret that Leinster, who recently boasted five Lions and 14 Irish internationals in their starting 15, benefit the most. The IRFU use the vast amount of money they make from their Six Nations broadcasting deal to help fund the four provinces, in particular Leinster, and in return hope to make more profits through competition wins whilst also improving their Irish core of players. As the IRFU set the wages of the players, it's almost impossible for players or agents to negotiate with them, and if they decide to leave Ireland, then they essentially wave goodbye to any hope of playing for the national side. It's estimated that Ireland spends 6.6 .6 million on each team per annum, but some insiders say that's a conservative estimation. Welsh and Scottish teams also compete in the URC, but neither union has the financial firepower of the Irish nor the player pool, and so struggle to attract enough talent to compete in the league, let alone to hold on to their homegrown stars. It's estimated that Scotland spends £4.2 million and Wales £5 million per club per annum. Dragons chairman David Buttress reckons the URC needs to be operated under some form of salary cap going forward due to the glaring inequalities in the league. He believes that in the majority of matches, unlike the Prem or Top 14, you know who's going to win and it doesn't make for a very entertaining product. South African clubs have somewhat defied this logic, however, as they do operate under a salary cap in the URC and have lost a vast amount of their international talent to global leagues, yet they still made up both teams in the inaugural URC final this year. South Africa's salary cap has caused much debate, with many believing that SA Rugby are shooting themselves in the foot by imposing restrictions which are counterintuitive and lead to a mass exodus of South African homegrown talent. 
In the Southern Hemisphere, things are done slightly differently, with both Rugby Australia and New Zealand Rugby implementing their own salary caps for their respective clubs, but the Super Rugby League itself operates without one. New Zealand's is about £3.4 million per club per annum, and Australia's is just a shade above that. In addition to this, somewhat uniquely, New Zealand Rugby has an individual salary cap listed at $195,000 a year. This may not look like a lot of money to keep hold of some of the greatest rugby players in the world. However, they managed to get around this issue by funding their players in alternative ways, making the salary cap somewhat misleading. On top of the £3.4 million per club, another £55 million is spent on players across a three-year period. Some of that covers insurance premiums, protecting players' income, and some of it's direct towards retirement funds. Incentive payments are another unique addition that encourages Super Rugby players to stay for provincial rugby. In the last collective, those who served one to four years in Super Rugby received a one-off $5,000 payment. Those who served five or more years pocketed $15,000. Then, of course, there's the cream of the crop. Every year, New Zealand Rugby tops up anywhere between 35 to 40 players on individually negotiated retainers. The All Blacks also receive $7,500 for each week in camp, about $130,000 if they're involved for the full year. Those significant top-ups allow the maximum New Zealand Super Rugby salary to be capped at $195,000, but not demonstrate the real value of the squads. With England, and to a certain extent others, labouring over how to make their salary cap work, the new El Dorado for players is Japan, where the league continues to go from strength to strength financially. All the clubs are backed by big corporate businesses, such as Panasonic and Coca-Cola, and so have huge budgets and no restrictions whatsoever. The salary cap, as demonstrated, exists in different leagues and countries for different reasons. Primarily exists to ensure some sort of equilibrium between sides in a domestic league, ensure a club's financial stability, and post-COVID has also become somewhat of a budgeting tool. However, with the rapid growth of global leagues such as the URC and the importance on the European Rugby Championship, without a salary cap being introduced across the competitions, those who are restricted by one will always feel they're at a disadvantage. But those clubs and countries who don't have one will argue that they'll lose their best players if they follow suit and implement one. Once again, it seems there's no easy answer to yet another problem that needs to be solved in rugby.